hopefully you can see that. <clears throat> so tonight about uh, the height uh, and uh, the way he's dressed and what we can learn uh, about the great high priest, uh, Jesus. Uh, some of this information is coming from the uh, Temple Institute in Israel, uh, mainly because they have thoroughly researched this topic. Uh, and remember that we don't have any of the original uh, uh, dress clothes material were made uh, by uh, Moses, and, well not by Moses personally, but by the people who were with Moses in the wilderness. Uh, we really only have the biblical narrative to describe these clothes and um, it's important to try and understand as best we can uh, what that meant. Okay, so the high priest, uh, what did he wear and why and what can it tell us? That's really the theme for tonight. The high priest garments. And of course, the high priest uh, that we read of, who was uh, Moses' brother, uh, Aaron, was uh, a prototype uh, of the real high priest, uh, which is Jesus. Uh, and here, um, we just need to look at a couple of scriptures to confirm that. So the book of Hebrews really ties up uh, a lot of things in Leviticus with how Jesus was their fulfillment. Uh, and it's good to read these two books side by side to uh, get a, a, a full understanding. And we can get an, uh, quite a few insights into uh, what Jesus achieved on the cross by reading Leviticus, things that are not, we're not told about in the New Testament, which is one reason why we need to be reading the whole Bible uh, and not just uh, the New Testament. Uh, or indeed just the Old Testament. We need to read the complete revelation of God. Hebrews 4.14 then, seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So it's encouraging the readers of the book of the Hebrews, which were the uh, Jewish people, the Judeans, that they should hold fast to their belief that Jesus was the Messiah. And indeed he is the great high priest. Let's just look at a couple more scriptures in Hebrews, verse 2, 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Some fancy words in there, but basically, Jesus needed to come as a man. He was God, but he needed to come as a man so he could fully relate to mankind and we could have a really great high priest who was the real because uh, that the function of a high priest was the interface if you like or the um uh, position between god and man the intercessor or the one bringing atonement uh, and the man and the person that we have jesus as our intercessor as the one that we come to to our access our heavenly father is indeed the best person because he is God and he is man. He knows what it's like to have the weaknesses of man, as we read in this next scripture. Um, uh, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, uh, seeing that we have a great high priest, it's the previous one, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus fully knows our weakness uh, and our fail failings uh, because he's been there. He, of course, didn't fail. He triumphed in every single aspect and is fully worthy to be a high priest. So that's just confirming the New Testament, the Hebrews commentary on the Jesus as being the high priest. Let's go back then and look at the high priest's garments. We'll see a lot of pictures tonight. Actually, it's one picture repeated over and over again, uh, but there's a lot of information in it, so we need to be clear about it. So he had two outfits. Uh, he had an outfit for best, a glorious one, that's described, and that's the one we've been looking at mostly. Uh, and he also had a plain white linen outfit for specifically for the Day of Atonement, but it was worn also uh, uh, on other occasions, but specifically for the Day of Atonement. And we're going to be looking at these two um, 
outfits, I can't think of a better word really, that the high priest wore and what they tell us. We're going to read the scriptures in a moment, uh, but let's just bear in mind, as we read through these scriptures for the first time, there were five specific materials mentioned over and over again. And I'm going to be bringing some meaning to those materials, why they're chosen. Um, you can probably have to guess at some of them uh, as we go through tonight. So Exodus 28, 6, the instruction was, this is instruction by God's Moses, and they shall make the ephod, I'm going to explain what an ephod is in a minute, of gold, of blue, of purple or crimson, of scarlet and fine twined linen with clever, cunning, um, artistic woven work. So the key materials are gold. Uh, this literally was strands of gold, which was uh, very thin and able to be used like a um, thread. Uh, blue, uh, sky blue colour. Uh, linen, which was white. Crimson, uh, sometimes translated purple, uh, and red. So that was the colour scheme with meaning. And I'm going to say, I'll come on to those meanings in a little moment. But just as we read through that, just remember these are the five key colours and materials. So Exodus 28, 4, this is where I'm going to start. And these are the garments which you shall make a breastplate, uh, an ephod, a robe, uh, an embroidered coat, uh, a mitre or a um, turban, uh, and a sash. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother. This is talking to Moses and his sons, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. So it was a condition that God was putting down that this, uh, these items needed to be worn in order for Aaron's, uh, Moses' brother Aaron to fulfill and be able to act out the priest's office. It was a condition that God laid down. So here's the picture, uh, which you're going to be seeing a lot of tonight. Uh, this is uh, uh, the understanding that has come through reading scripture, testing out the words, comparing it with uh, historical notes, uh, just out of interest, uh, uh, Florius Josephus uh, wrote a, a considerable amount about uh, the history uh, of events around about the time of Jesus. He was a Jewish historian, uh, also was himself of the priestly line. And some of his writings contain uh, some descriptions of the high priestly garments. So this has all been considered. Uh, of course, the biblical narrative takes precedence, uh, has to fit in with that, uh, in arriving at what we believe was and is the high priest's outfit. So uh, just another bit of background, you, the, the Temple Institutes is something that's been set up in Israel to uh, set up everything necessary to restart the Old Testament rites uh, and rituals in a new temple, which is yet to be built, but is planned, paid for, uh, materials are ready to go, um, to bring back what they believe, the, the Jewish um, believer, uh, non-believers rather, the Jewish people believe uh, is restoring their relationship to their God. Now, of course, this is all foretold uh, in the end times prophets, that things will be set up again. And it's almost like Israel gets a rerun uh, at the events of when Jesus was uh, on the earth ministering and crucified to really get them into the uh, understanding of the Messiah and that the Messiah has already come, but he's coming again. So this is what they're planning to do. This is what uh, the research has all been about. But what can we learn? Uh, and we can learn quite a bit. So let's just have a look and go through the items. I'm just going to take it from head to toe. This is not the order it's in scripture, but it'll do. So on the head was uh, a turban. Some translators call it a mitre. It was uh, descriptive of a bandaged format uh, around the head. It's made of white linen. On top of that is something that scripture calls a crown. Uh, it is a sort of, uh, represents kingship certainly, uh, and has some writing on it, which we'll come to later. We have, um, this very strange thing called an ephod. And the word ephod we have in English is just simply a transliteration of the Hebrew word. It's not translated at all. They've just lifted the sounds and the, and the words and made a new word in English called ephod. Uh, and that's the Hebrew word too. 
so it's this rather strange thing uh, that is the sort of purpley colours in this picture here. Uh, those purpley colours, in fact, is it's not purple, it's supposed to depict the woven red, blue, gold, white, crimson colours into uh, an artistic pattern. And if you can see closely on there, that really is what it is showing. But this sort of shoulder piece come girdle, come, um, I'm not quite sure what you call it, it's called an ephod, was there uh, and it has meaning and purpose. Underneath that, we have a blue uh, robe. This is a single piece with a head hole, so you pop it over your head, uh, and that's sort of held in by the ephod. Under that is uh, linen garments, white, uh, and not shown in the picture are linen breeches that the high priest would also wear to cover up. Uh, they shouldn't show any part of the of the body. The idea is not showing off man, it's telling us something about the high priest's role. And there's nothing on his feet, and the picture here doesn't have his feet anyway, he was barefoot. And this is because when you stand in a holy place, as Moses was instructed to do at the burning bush, you take off your sandals, you are standing uh, on holy ground, and you stand barefoot. Now this is idea of being respective of whom you're meeting and where you're standing is in many cultures, many people uh, will take off their shoes and sandals when visiting other people's homes as a sign of respect uh, and a sign obviously of leaving the dirt behind of the street and the daily life and stepping into uh, a, a clean environment. And this is what holiness is about. It's about cleanliness, right standing with God. Uh, it's about as you are not carrying in the dirt and the trials and the traumas of the world. So that's the basic outline of the high priestly garment. Um, just a little bit more about the breastplate. This was a um, set, this is an, another woven item, a separate woven item, uh, which had 12 stones in it. We'll read about those in a minute. Uh, and this was uh, behind it was a little pocket uh, where the two special stones, the Urim and the Thummin, were placed which were used to discern the will of God, which we'll talk about a little bit later on as well. So there we have the high priest and the layout. Uh, it's all quite ornate uh, and it all has meaning. So let's look at some of it. Let's first read the scriptures, 28.5. This is Exodus 28.5. They shall take the gold, blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod, that's the purple round bit with the shoulder pieces of gold, purple, blue and scarlet thread and fine woven linen artistically worked. It shall have shoulder straps joined at its two edges and so it shall be joined together. Now I just want to point out here that in the woven part there's intimate linking of the gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread. They are intimately linked together in the role of atonement. And I'll come on more to that later but the idea of weaving them together, the instruction was to weave these things together so they were displaying characteristics. Uh, they were giving us a message, gold, blue, purple, uh, scarlet, uh, sometimes called purple thread. Verse eight, uh, and the intricately woven band of the ephod, that's the bit around the middle, uh, uh, which is on it, shall be of the same workmanship made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. You see how it's emphasized over time again. Uh, and a fine woven linen. And you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone in order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, i.e. a signet ring, you shall engrave the stones with the names of the sons of Israel. And you shall set them in settings of gold. And these were the can't really see them on this picture here, but they're actually sitting on the shoulders of the uh, high priest like epaulets. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod, a memorial stone for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders. <clears throat> um, and you shall make two chains of pure gold 
like braided cords and fasten the braided chains in the settings. You shall make the breastplate of judgment, note that word there, judgment, artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod, again entwined into this, it's not something that can be taken apart. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. Uh, it shall be doubled into a square, uh, a span shall be its length and a span shall be its width. So this thing was doubled over to make the pocket uh, that we talked about at the beginning uh, and where we were in these special stones, which we'll also talk about in a minute. Just trying to give you um, a, an overview. So this breastplate then, uh, these were the stones that were in it. You shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, an emerald in the first row. Second row shall be turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. Third row a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, again, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of his signet, each one with its own name. So they shall be according to the 12 tribes. So here you had these rows of stones, all 12 of them, and each stone had the name of an individual tribe uh, of Israel on it. And Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial, bringing to remembrance, before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. Let's go back to the picture. <clears throat> so we have the names of Israel on the epaulets, on the shoulders here, uh, and we also have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel individually on each of these unique stones, some of which we don't actually know what they are. Um, because words change over time and it's not completely clear what some of these words mean. The point is, and there's a couple of points here uh, which I want to deal with. Firstly, you may know there's another character in the Bible who had brightly coloured stones, some of which are the same as these, uh, and he uh, had 10 rather than the 12 as his special stones. And his name is Lucifer. Okay, so you have this character Lucifer, which is also known as Satan, of course, the deceiver, the enemy, uh, arch enemy of God and his plan. Also, if you like, has a kind of priestly function. Now, he's not a one that is any longer current, but he uses his coloured stones, and you see them in new age type things and healings and channeling where people are using their stones to make predictions to bring about alignment uh, of spirits alignment of uh, flows in the body uh, and you find them in treatment centers spas all over the place he is using them in a deceptive and demonic way here we're not really to get into how they are uh, to be used in any way. They are there for beauty. They are there as a representative of the different characteristics that are also associated with the tribes of Israel. And again, we don't know which stone really is associated with which name. We can make some assumptions, but we don't know for sure. Uh, and the point is the tribes of Israel and the churches are grafted in part of Israel. Um, has different characters. We all have different characters. Some uh, shine out in one particular way and are not so good in another. We all have our weaknesses. We all have our strengths. And the point is God recognizes individuality. We are individuals. Um, some people like to sort of put us into boxes or well, you've got this kind of characteristic and this type of personality and you should behave in this way. But we're unique before God. We're unique creations and he knows us uniquely and personally. So while we might have uh, personality traits, um, we are not to be put into boxes um, to say that we should always work within that personality trait because God can use our weaknesses uh, in his glory and splendor to show his greatness and power. So just because we don't have a strength in a certain area does not mean that God can't use us. We're individuals, we have strengths and weaknesses, 
God is glorified in our weakness where he shows his strength. He knows us intimately. They're on his heart. So whatever your character, whatever your nature is, it's on God's heart. Okay, so that's the location there. So we have uh, onyx stones on the shoulders and they are a burden. And there's noting here that church is grafted in part of Israel. Um, but we also have the names of the 12 stones on the heart of the high priest. Um, and these stones signify everlastingness. The onyx stone was right there at the beginning of creation. It's one of the few stones, gold and onyx, mentioned as the first part of the creation because it is an enduring thing. And when your name is etched on a stone, um, it is uh, ir irremovable. So if you're on the high priest's heart with your name written in stone, and we have the Revelation scripture, which also points to that. Um, you are a burden, but you are on his heart. So our sins are a burden, but you are on his heart because he is relieving uh, the burden through his own pierced heart. And we're going to see some analogies of what Jesus did on the cross in a little while. So they're in two places. The names on the shoulders as a burden and on the heart because of the love, uh, because of the size. And we also want to be, ought to be, close to our high priest's heart. So it's a two-way thing. We're on his heart and we should want to be there too, knowing his heart. And this was where you have the Urim and the Thummim, which were the two special stones which slotted inside the pocket uh, and we used, they were used extensively in David and Saul's time, particularly to uh, discern the will of God. So they gave, we don't really know how they work and uh, we don't uh, need to get into that really, but you could get either a yes, a no, or a no response from these stones. Okay, so it wasn't really quite a random thing. Oh, it's a black one, that's yes. It didn't actually work like that. We're not quite sure how it worked, but you could get a no answer. Uh, from bringing out these stones and they were used so quite often you will read and it's worth going back and looking at some of these scriptures uh, when David is asking shall we go up before the Lord you get this funny sort of uh, repeated response like yes you should go up before the Lord because what's coming back from the high priest uh, is a yes no answer or no response as in the case when Saul sought the Lord he got no answer because the Lord wasn't speaking to him because he was completely out of uh, favour and grace with the Lord at that time. So um, don't ever get into the idea that you can consult God using stones of any kind. This is not what is being said here. Uh, that is an occultic thing. I've just alluded to that with Satan and all his stones, which are very similar to these. Um, this is not a means of consulting God. It's telling us that we are names are written uh, engraved as a believer in messiah jesus as a believer in the high priest which is jesus the um it's an eternal thing and we need to be seeking his heart through his word through prayer fasting and seeking the will of god and then holding on to whatever it is that he says to us and moving forward with that so that's just the stones. Don't let people get you carried away with too much meaning and symbolism on those because actually we don't know a lot and scripture doesn't tell us a lot. So let's keep it that way. Okay, let's go back to these five materials. The atonement requires five parts. And I'll just go into that. And it's symbolized, the atonement is symbolized in gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen or white, if you like. So here they are, here's those materials. And here's their meanings. Uh, the gold is imperishable. Gold is often used and in the format that it was used in the tabernacle uh, to describe how things don't decay with time and age. All other metals, silver, uh, bronze uh, are subject to decay. Gold is not. Um, it's costly because it's rare. But the important thing is it's imperishable. And I've written that twice, uh, not for any good reason, but just because I rushed. Uh, blue. Now this is a, a, a bit more subtle. This is the word of God and his infallible promises. How do we know that? Um, well, I was seeking the Lord about this many years ago. Now what's the blue mean? It's cropping up all over the place to do with the tabernacle. And then I, I, I realized, or well, the Lord led me to 
the fact that during transportation of the tabernacle, so when it was being moved from camp to camp, they wrapped everything in blue cloth. They wrapped everything, you know, the pots, the pans, the table, the candles, stick and things were wrapped in blue cloth. Oh, so that's a bit strange. Uh, and then I felt the Lord is saying to me, that's the word of God. When things are not visible, when things are not uh, uh, visibly operational, it's still spoken about in the word. It's still testified in the word and the promises still hold. Just because the tabernacle's in transit, being moved from one place to another, does not in any way invalidate its purpose or its operation. It's simply covered by the word of God. The word, the uh, promises all hold good, uh, no matter what the state of those things in them. And have all been uh, uh, lost and out the way now, but the promises still hold true. And then this was further confirmed uh, by the fact that, uh, I can't remember where I read this now, the, the little tassels on the prayer shawls, uh, there's, a, there's a blue thread, a single blue thread among, in that tassel, which is supposed to be held when the Ten Commandments are recited by uh, the Jewish people. So you have this extra insight which confirms the fact that blue represents commandments, the word of God, and uh, this is uh, part of the atonement. He has promised right to the, from the time of... Um, Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, that he would provide a deliverer, a redeemer, a saviour. And of course, we know that it was set out before even then, in the, before the foundation of the world, it was agreed upon uh, that this would happen. So we have the word of God represented by the blue, and it's his infallible promise. That's the thing to hold on to. If God has spoken to you, and I'm talking as much to me as to anybody else, if he's made you a promise, uh, it will come to pass. You may get to the point, like I do sometimes, where you think, well, how can possibly this be the case? Uh, everything seems to be going in the opposite direction. Uh, God is, uh, takes us to the limits of our faith. He takes us to limits so that it's, it's never us. It's never us. It's not the amount of prayer I'm doing. It's not the amount of Bible study I'm doing. It's him and his work, and he gets the glory. He's made a promise. He will make sure it comes to pass. Okay, linen, uh, that is more obvious, it's pure and sinless, no stain, no mark on it, uh, and pure white, and it's to do with purity and sinlessness. The crimson sacrifice, now, to really to appreciate this, uh, I, I would encourage you to go to that web link shown here, and I'll just read it out in case you're listening to the audio copy only, Reasons for Hope Jesus, so that's one word, reasonsforhopejesus.com uh, forward slash psalm hyphen 22, hyphen crimson, hyphen scarlet, hyphen worm. To say that again, reasonsforhopejesus.com forward slash psalm dash 22 dash crimson dash scarlet dash worm. And it deals with the life cycle of the uh, little beetle or the worm as it's referred to in Psalm 22, which is the crimson dye was taken from. And you find this humble little creature is playing out the gospel message by pinning itself to a piece of wood uh, as it excretes a crimson dye uh, and dies there and passes on that crimson dye over and it gives birth to its uh, uh, children, if you like, uh, the next generation. And they all come out stained with the crimson dye. And it speaks, uh, it's a very, very short summary. And I really would encourage you to uh, read that in, in more detail. It really details the sacrifice, the dying sacrifice uh, on the cross. That's what the scarlet um, or crimson uh, is about. And it's about the scarlet thread of redemption that we hear spoken about as it weaves its way through scripture. It was the scarlet thread that Rahab uh, tied to her, her window when Jericho was being demolished and her part of the building didn't fall down and she and her family were saved. Um, that's a hint at this same scarlet redemptive thing. It's to do with sacrifice, uh, atoning sacrifice. And red, of course, that's very straightforward. That's blood atonement. In order to get any atonement, there needs to be blood shed. Um, that was the message that's gone straight through the Bible. That's what all the sacrifice is about. It's not acceptable to bring a vegetable sacrifice to God. It has to be a living creature and blood needs to be shed because it indicates that Jesus, as the son of the living God, his blood needed to be shed because the life is in the blood. So we have this five-fold um, coloured um, atonement message, if you like. It's costly, it's imperishable, it is for good, uh, it doesn't wear out. 
uh, it's God's promise. He promised it. He brings his promises to be fulfilled. Uh, and he did it on the cross in Jesus. Uh, Jesus, of course, is sinless. Couldn't make the atonement for us unless he was without sin, pure and perfect. And as you read in those Hebrew scriptures uh, from the book of Hebrews, it talked about him being um, without sin. He was a sacrifice, uh, his life. And this is the gospel message. You might as well bring it out here. Uh, Jesus was God. Uh, he came as man. He did nothing wrong. He was totally obedient to God. We are disobedient. We run our own lives. Therefore, we are out of favour with God. Therefore, we need a redeemer because the consequence of being out of favour with God because of our rebellion is that we go to hell. God doesn't want that. So he's brought his son, Jesus, his only son, Jesus, uh, to pay for us to go to heaven. And he did that on the cross. But you need to go. If you're listening, to this, you need to go to Jesus with your sin and confess that you are rebellious to him and it applies to everybody there is no exception that you should not be in charge of your own life you shouldn't be running your own life and uh, uh, I would uh, encourage you if you're an unbeliever to recognize this that you're a sinner that you need to uh, turn now to your creator uh, and ask your sin your rebelliousness you're running your own life to be uh, forgiven and start now to follow Jesus and to ask him to come into your life and to be in charge of your life instead of you. And you thank him for the blood which you shed on the cross. It's been done, but you need to go and ask and receive that so that you can be what's called born again. OK, let's go back to this chap, the high priest. The white linen undergarments. Now we know the secrets of the color coding. It shows the real high priest is perfect, pure and holy. Of course, the man. Uh, Aaron was imperfect and all the descendants of Aaron were imperfect. Jesus is the only one who's perfect. So at the basis, the undergarment is pure and holy. The blue robe on top shows that the high priest is both the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. You read about that in John. Um, <clears throat> and we see uh, that it's a fulfillment. The promises that God has made right from the beginning are fulfilled in Jesus. Now notice this, this rather uh, intricate way that this ephod is hung together. It's a bit fragile in some ways. It's not made rigid and you know, all sewed in and can't come off. We've got these chains holding it up and we've got these blue ties at the side. And if you didn't have those chains and those blue ties, the whole thing would flop off and would no longer be close to the heart of God. It's held in place by the word of God. Okay. The whole what Jesus achieved on the cross is held in place because it's a promise that is fulfilled, is kept, and is infallible. God's word holds together the world. Uh, God's word is true and infallible, and so you know you can read the Bible, uh, New King James Bible, I can certainly say, the King James Bible are good Bibles to read. This is the infallible word of God. You can trust it uh, because it's what God has said, and he brings what he says to pass. He will speak to you through uh, these words in the Bible. And this is indicated uh, with the gold and the uh, blue in the design here. The gold chain to the breastplate is held on uh, in place. It's only held in place by the paying of the high, pr high price that Jesus paid on the cross. It cost him his life, the life of God on the cross. And it's just held in place by gold and by blue. It's only by the expense God was willing to pay with his own son and the certainty of his spoken promise that this whole thing holds together. Okay, let's go back to read scripture. Verse 15, this is still from Exodus 28. You shall make the breastplate of judgment. So this breastplate also is to do with judgment. Uh, seeking, as we found, the uh, will of God uh, and also carrying the judgment of the people who were being, having their sins atoned for. Artistically woven, according to the workmanship of the ephod, that's this thing around here, the purple bit. Uh, and you should make the gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine woven linen. You shall make it again. It's pushing this uh, concept of these five materials being woven together. Uh, you shall make the robe of the ephod all blue, and that, that's the word of God. There shall be an opening for his head, and here's the interesting bit, in all the middle of it. So his head would go through, drop it over his head, it was a single piece. It shall have a woven binding all round its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, that's chain mail that is, uh, so that it does not tear. 
we read in John, going right up to the New Testament, John 19, 23, about Jesus' place. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part. And also the tunic. Now, the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. And then goes on to say that the soldiers didn't cut that one up because it was valuable, because it was a single piece. Jesus was wearing the same type of clothing as the high priest. Okay, Exodus 8, 28, 4. And these are the garments which you will make. Um, uh, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me as priest. Um, whoops, I've got a duplicate. <laughs> I knew I had that uh, gone through these carefully. So that's that John 19, 23 again, uh, saying that the blue garments with a hole in it was the same as the one that Jesus wore. His wasn't necessarily blue, but it was the same style. Okay, and on the hem, let's just look at the hem of this garment. Upon its hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, that is not a real pomegranate, that's one that's been woven, a golden bell and a pomegranate that are alternating around the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and, it, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. So, um, uh, also the high priest had, uh, when he was ministering on the day of atonement, would have a rope tied around his ankle, uh, so that if he did uh, get struck down dead for whatever reason before the presence of God, and that, that could happen, he could be dragged out of there. Uh, and the bells around the bottom, let's just have a picture of those, is a, a, an artist's impression, as a hem of the gaunt, the bells and the, uh, the woolly pomegranates, if you like, uh, between them. As he moved around, as he was ministering to the Lord, they would bang together and jingle and tinkle. And so the people outside would know that he was in there doing his stuff. And if he went quiet, there was a problem. And that's when they would give him a little while and they'd drag him out by the rope because they would possibly, he might have been struck down dead because he'd uh, not been uh, working right before the Lord in his job. And interesting enough, one of these tiny little bells has been discovered uh, in the uh, the region of the uh, Temple Mount. Uh, I think it was discovered about three or four years ago uh, and has been uh, identified as being one of the bells that was on the high priest's garment. It had dropped down in a crack uh, in some of the uh, stones and the flooring and um, it uh, just simply confirms that what we know was happening at that time really did happen. It's also always useful to get archaeological evidence to uh, uh, help us in our conversations with other people and to encourage ourselves that you know it is true it did all happen so that's just a picture close up picture so um we know because we have heard that the atonement has been made we've heard witnesses we hear people speaking of uh, uh their time when they uh, have become born again when they've repented we hear people speak of works that jesus has done so we hear too that atonement has been made, just like these tinkling of the bells we hear, if we're willing to be silent and to listen to the still small voice of God, we may hear, if you like, a tinkling uh, indicating that atonement has been made and is effective. Now also, so let's click on the headwear, uh, and now you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. So on this crown here was written or engraved the words, holiness to the Lord and she put it on a blue cord that's the word of God again so it's held in place by the word of God by this certainty uh, Jesus was holy as the high priest uh, that it may be on the turban incidentally the uh, winding round of the white linen to make the turban which um, uh, and also there's a, there's a sash at the side was indicative of the uh, Binding up of the um, grave clothes, the bandages they used to embalm people. Uh, it was indicative of death uh, uh, on the head. And also, when anybody wore any headgear in these times, it was also indicative of submission to a higher authority. So the high priest was in submission to the authority of God, of course, uh, and Jesus himself was submitting himself to his heavenly father. 
So where the headpiece is being worn, it's uh, indicating that there's a submission to a higher authority. Uh, so we have the gold crown, kingly crown, because Jesus also was a king. The high priests were never kings, um, but Jesus is also a king. Verse 38, so it shall be on Aaron's forehead that he may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel uh, hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always on his forehead that they may be accepted uh, before. And I've got to read my own slide at the bottom there. So um, we have the iniquity being borne by the high priest. So this again is telling us what happens to Jesus on the cross. He was bearing as the prophecies say, the iniquity of us all when he was on the cross. He was there as a high priest, uh, but he himself was the sacrifice um, and he was bearing our iniquity. So this is confirmed by this clothing as well. Okay, I want to now jump to the linen clothes uh, that were worn by the high priest. So he would lay aside the clothes for glory and splendor, those ones we've been looking at, when he went into the temple on the Day of Atonement. So this is where he went in once a year to make, uh, and he took in the blood of the lamb and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. It was only ever done once a year, only time the high priest was allowed into that part of the tabernacle. And he sprinkled the blood seven times on the mercy seat. But when he was doing that, he was wearing linen clothes only. And you can see an analogy here. Just as Jesus, as God, laid aside his glory and godliness and became a man to make atonement. So the high priest prefigures that in that he laid aside the glorious clothes and just wore the linen clothes, the humble clothes, to make the atonement, just as Jesus made the atonement. So it's indicative, illustrating um, that Jesus laid his side, uh, his glory and splendor in heaven to humble, be humble and take on the form of man. So let's just read about that. This shall be a statute for you forever, for you. This is Leviticus 16, 29. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. And there we have a picture uh, which is depicting uh, the priest on the day of atonement approaching the veil. This is depicted in Solomon's temples as a massive veil. Um, and the high priest, they see him all dressed in white with his linen turban on and the, and if you like, the bandages hanging down, the sash hanging down from the turban, indicative of the bandages of the grave clothes. Uh, this is again a picture taken from the Temple Institute website. Um, and so it's the holy uh, whiteness, the purity uh, that Jesus had when he was making the atonement. And just uh, incidentally, you can see in this picture the uh, part of the menorah, the candles with the burning oil shown and so little oil lamps on the top, uh, which is, it was indeed outside the veil where the Holy of Holies was. <clears throat> Interesting, then he shall make, this is carrying on, then he shall make atonement for the Holy Sanctuary, he shall make atonement for the tabernacle meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Everything needs to have atonement. Everything in your life, my life, needs to be atoned for. Nothing can go as it is when we die. Um, these uh, failing bodies, these bodies which are flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They need to be fully atoned physically uh, and we need to be transformed. Uh, verse 34, this shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. And in Leviticus 16, 23, then Aaron shall come into the table of meeting, shall take off the linen garments, which he shall put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And look what happens. When the real high priest also left his linen clothes after the atonement in 
the place where he died. Luke 23, 50. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, good and just man. He had not consented to decision and deed um, about having Jesus crucified. He was, in Ar he was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And look what he did. He took it down and he wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulchre that was of hewn stone, wherein no man had ever bathed before. So here, completing the atonement completely outside, if you like, of Jesus' control, because he was dead at this time, he was wrapped in the linen of the high priest, would be how he would be dressed on the day of atonement, because he was making atonement. And later on in Luke, Luke 24, 12, we see, then arose Peter, and he ran into the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves. Have you ever wondered why they were there? And departed, wondering in himself at what at that which was come to pass. Those linen clothes were laid aside because the high priestly job of the atonement had been completed. They were no longer needed, just as was prefigured um, and instructed by God for the earthly high priests uh, in those times uh, before and up until the time of Jesus. Absolutely fulfillment in the detail. Hallelujah. So I thought I'd just end on that um, because I, it was just a tremendous point. So there are lots of other things I didn't read all that, all the detail of Exodus 28. Uh, once you've got the keys, the colours, the colour coding, once you've got the uh, you know, linking together of the high priest being Jesus, you can see uh, many, much more in those passages um, about the high priest. So there we go. Hallelujah to you, to your word, Lord Jesus. Amen.